Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, heads of state, scientists and campaigners head to Dakar for the World Water Forum as the UN warns that water security across the continent is dangerously low despite huge reserves of untapped groundwater. Also, negotiators from developing nations say that a recent failure to settle a treaty on the laws governing the high seas comes at the expense of poorer countries and costs have huge environmental and economic values. And rickshaws, motorcycle taxis and bicycle cabs have been banned in Burundi's biggest city. Authorities say that they're too dangerous for Bujumbura's roads. But first, the UN said that water security in Africa is unacceptably low. This despite researchers saying that there is enough groundwater across the continent to provide everyone with drinking water for at least five years of drought. As the World Water Forum got underway in Dakar on Monday, there were calls for more financial and technical investment to get to, treat and distribute available water. Only 13 out of 54 countries are deemed to be water secure. Africa's water crisis hampers growth and stability, and their fears it could get worse as populations grow. Our correspondent sent us this report from Dakar. Usman's tap hasn't delivered a drop of water in days. He lives in Wakam, a Dakar neighbourhood where water shortages are all too common. Running water is rarely available in my house. It's sometimes only available at 2 a.m. We have to manage during the day to get water. It's really very difficult. With the population growing about 3% a year, Dakar's water supply has failed to keep pace. This campaigner runs a digital consumer platform. He regularly gets complaints from Dakar residents with no water. In a capital like Dakar, I personally cannot understand that in 2022 we end up talking about water problems. We have many means, demonstrations, petitions, or meetings with officials. We will really try all paths to try to solve this problem. The National Water Company mainly relies on Lake Guerre, which is about 300 kilometres from the capital, to supply the city. But to meet increasing demand, the companies turn to the ocean. Their desalination plant is planned for 2025 to turn seawater into drinking water. The first destination plant that we're going to build is going to start shortly in Manel. It will allow us to diversify the sources of water production. Water distribution will be improved. Availability will also be improved. The state is also counting on a newly built drinking water treatment plant to provide an additional 100,000 cubic metres of water per day to the Dakar network. That should be up and running over the coming months. Well, negotiators from developing countries say that a failure to settle on a treaty to protect the high seas that, that uh, says that their nations risk being on the sharp end of the fallout. On Friday, the clock ran out at UN talks that were meant to deliver a long-awaited binding agreement to prevent the loss of biodiversity, rain in unchecked industrial-scale fishing and bioprospecting. Seas are being pushed to the brink by human activities, with richer countries reaping much of the economic benefit of the pre precarious status quo. With me now is Dr. Essam Mohammed, who is the representative for Eritrea at those talks. Uh, doctor, thanks so much for speaking to us. Now, first of all, why does this conversation about the laws of the high seas matter for developing countries, particularly those in Africa? Well, it does indeed matter. Uh, we're talking about developing countries or the African continent by itself, which is home to people who are disproportionately reliant on natural resources for their livelihood, the ocean in particular here but it's also home to vulnerable coastal communities that are facing multiple economic and climate shocks. But also, if I may add, it's, it's the high seas are so far yet so close, particularly to Africa. Um, some of the African nations, such as Somalia, Tanzania and Liberia, are so critically overexposed to the negative effects of some of uh, the activities in the high seas. And maybe just to put this into context for instance in the state that we do, where if you could imagine and your viewers could imagine dropping uh, rubber ducks, maybe hundreds or thousands of miles away from the coastline, and the sooner they get to your 
coastal area or to your shoreline, the more exposed you are. And those countries I mentioned, Somalia and Tanzania and Liberia, for instance, in a highly exposed uh, country. So it's critically important. But also, George, if you may allow me to add one more point as well, is this is also equally a quest for justice as well. So currently, as you rightly said uh, earlier, a handful of countries with technical and financial means continue to reap the benefits of the ocean at the expense of uh, our humanity as a whole. And therefore, developing countries are saying status quo is not an option and that the high seas must be regarded as a common heritage of humankind and deliver a shared prosperity for all. So what exactly are the hoped for goals from this treaty? Uh, the most important thing is to be able to fill the governance gap. So Georgia, we're talking about 50% of the planet's surface area where we see the governance vacuum now. So this 50% of the planet's surface area, which is the high seas, we don't have any legal instrument to govern it more um, effectively and coherently. Therefore, um, this treaty is so critical in filling that gap. Um, therefore, the question in terms of you know, what's holding it, it is, um, I guess, the, 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 the lack of trust, if I may say, to be honest with you, between the richer countries and the uh, and less richer countries or developing countries. For instance, you know, as I said earlier, the developing countries would want to see the, the high seas being regarded as a common heritage of mankind and to take into account, uh, you know, the human you know, implications uh, of uh, the, in the way we govern the high seas. And uh, while the richer nations, uh, in all honesty, I think it's about time that they appreciate the urgency of the matter and start making concessions in order for these negotiations to move forward and realize the need uh, for a, 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 a governance mechanism for this common good we're talking about. I, I use this very carefully, the word common good, because as much as no country claims any ownership over the moon, for instance, which is regarded as a common heritage of humankind, and it has to be the same for the high seas as well. I think if we have understanding on that, we are almost ready to strike a deal. So you're a specialist in marine management. You've been advocating for your continent. But is this really an issue that's urgent as a priority for African nations themselves? Is You know, when they're facing, you know, development issues, uh, good governance, food security, etc., aren't those more of a priority than the rules governing the high seas? Again, as I said uh, earlier, um, the, the, these countries, particularly like in Africa, as you rightly said, you know, they have a number of other development priorities. But having said that, they are also disproportionately heavily reliant on um, uh, on natural resources such as the ocean. So a healthy ocean means uh, better for security or nutrition security or income opportunities or employment opportunities. So without having that natural capital as an asset, you know, which is going to be the main um, engine for our economic and social transformation in the region, you cannot realize that. Therefore, I think that's why it's so critical that, you know, to reduce the vulnerabilities of our communities, of our economies, in our infrastructure, that we need to have a healthy ocean. And without that, it's seriously an existential threat for a number of countries. Thank you very much, Dr. Essam Mohammed, there speaking to me about the uh, attempts to settle on a treaty governing the laws dealing with the high seas. Now, at least 16 people are thought to have been killed in a raid on Sunday by armed men on motorbikes in the northwestern Nigerian state of Zamfara. Meanwhile, President Mohamedou Buhari said that security in the southeast will be ramped up after a spate of attacks in Imo state over the weekend. Samuel Okoya has more. The Nigerian government plans to ramp up security in southeast Nigeria as insecurity in the region worsens. President Mohamedou Buhari announced the decision to reduce the security of the region following last weekend's spate of violence in Imo State. Over the weekend, at least two major police stations in the state were attacked. In one incident, gunmen killed two policemen, burned down vehicles, and freed suspects from police cells. The police said four gunmen were killed during an attack and on, at another police station. The home of Professor George Obiazo President General of the Influential Ohanese Indigo was attacked and set ablaze over the weekend. 
Southeast Nigeria has seen a wave of attacks and killings in the wake of agitation for the region to form a breakaway country to be known as Biafra. Security agents say the attacks are being carried out by Biafran agitators. But those agitating for a Biafran state say the attacks are state-sponsored, aimed at discrediting their struggle. President Mohamed Buhari's plans to review the security of the Southeast region may involve the deployment of large contingents of troops to the area for military operations. Samuel Koya there for us. Now, rickshaws, motorcycle taxis and bicycle cabs have been banned in Burundi's biggest city on Monday. Authorities say that they're too dangerous for Bujumbura's roads, but drivers say that it will put thousands out of work. Long queues formed outside this Bujumbura bus stop as hundreds of Burundians desperately tried to catch a ride to work after a citywide ban on rickshaws, motorcycle taxis and bicycle cabs came into effect on Monday. In the economic capital, where these vehicles represented the main mode of transportation, drivers were left scratching their heads at the decision to take away their livelihoods. This news has really upset us as we drive these vehicles to make a living. They were helping us feed our families. Burundi's interior minister last month accused rickshaws and motorcycles of being responsible for a majority of fatal traffic accidents. Shortly after, the government announced plans to ban these vehicles, as well as privately owned bicycles and scooters, from Bujumbura's city centre. The unpopular measure is likely to cause traffic congestion in a city where public transportation is lacking, yet authorities appeared determined to enforce the new law. I don't see the point of contesting this. There is nothing I can do. A lot of people will suffer, but we cannot change anything. The new measure will leave an estimated 20,000 rickshaws and motorcycle taxis out of commission, potentially impacting the daily commute of over 600,000 Burundians. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.